It's September 24th, 2008. I'm Stephen G. Erickson. I'm here with Sue Johnston. And we're going to talk about what happened October 11th, 2001 at 3 and 5 Church Street, Stafford Springs, Connecticut. Go ahead. Want to tell me what happened? Um, Stephen came to my door after work. He had been working. And he told me that he had just gotten attacked out in the driveway. Well, I already, already knew who it was going to be because he had been sending threatening phone calls to my answering machine, which I asked the police to look at. To, listen, to listen to. To listen to, yeah. And who, who was that individual? I believe it was Armorall. No, the, uh, the individual that left the threatening. Oh, Brian Caldwell, which I've known for like years because he used to hang around with one of the tenants that, in the building that I owned. So he's a, a drunk with uh, teeth missing in the front, yeah. and he's known to do whatever drug can be found. Right. Uh, Including falling down drunk in front of the police officers, and they don't do nothing. So we always figured he was some kind of an informant because he got away with everything. So he left threatening messages where he named me, um, and he said that I would be killed when I got home that day. Yeah. And had he been threatening me for about two weeks, yeah, he had been back and forth up to the apartment trying to find you, and he was knocking at my door asking me where you were, which I didn't know. You were working as far as I knew, you know. You were my friend, but you were my landlord, and you worked a job outside of that, painting, whatever you could find to work. <laughs> All right. Uh, it was maybe uh, three weeks or so before the incident that uh, I had Mark Irving, with an I, yeah. uh, build some steps for me. Right, um, and lakefront property. Yeah, and uh, they were supposed to be 36 inches wide, uh, and he was supposed to do all the stairs all the way up and put the railings up, labor, for $1,000. Yeah. So he put stairs up about halfway up. They were 32 inches. Yeah. Um, he'd already been paid $500 of the 1000 Yeah. And I told him not to hire Brian Caldwell under any circumstances. Right, because you didn't want to have deal with him and he said don't worry about it because he said that right in my kitchen one day that so not to worry about Brian Caldwell he'd take care of him you'd only have to deal with him alone yeah because um, I told him he don't pay Caldwell when he works for you, you don't pay anybody so right. you, you are to work alone right and so he agreed uh -huh. so he built 32 inch stairs up halfway um, so I had to tear down all the uh, stairs that he had done uh, put in 36 inch stairs uh, which I had to pay for lumber again so um, he got in $500 and uh, Brian Caldwell had helped him um, where I told him um, I, I uh, you know absolutely not and I also told Brian Caldwell in your presence um, I'm not responsible for paying for, um, for you right. you're not working on the project period yeah. so then what happened after uh, Brian Caldwell wasn't paid by uh, Mark Irving, which he has a history of doing. Right. Um, He's not paying me back money that I loaned him, so he didn't go to jail for non-child support. He, he borrowed over $3,000. Yeah, he did pay back, you know, almost half. And then after that, and after this incident, he t kept telling me to try to get it from you. And he owed me money, so he's, he's basically just a person that borrows money, cheats people, yeah. and he lies, and... Uh, uh, He's able to go out to the bars pretty much every night. I don't know if he's still doing this. Yeah, he was gambling. He was playing dice at the bar with what should have been my money, paying you know, paying me back or you know, paying his worker rather than he having could, them make threatening phone calls for you. He made that he made a comment that he could drive drunk whenever he want because he gave police information. Right. They didn't touch him. Yeah. Brian Caldwell was also known to turn in uh, other drug dealers and. So he was also a police informant, and police don't arrest their police, in, police informants. If they do, they... There's nobody on the street. Um, yeah, there's nobody on the street. Police informants bring in revenue. Yeah. So I owned 3 and 5 Church Street. They were uh, buildings that I had uh, fixed up from a boarded-up condition. One was a Victorian. Uh, there were nothing work, electric, plumbing... Uh, the roof, chimneys, there was nothing that worked. So I spent hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. on these properties, fixing them up. And I, real, really nice, 
properties for... We were trying to clean up the streets of Stafford to make it look better, just like we did on 99 Main Street. You owned that property. Yeah. And then when you got divorced, you became my tenant. Right. Uh, so for two weeks before uh, I was attacked on my property, you know, he was threatening my life. Uh, he was telling other tenants, like uh, Don and Melissa. Yeah. So there was people that were aware that he was banging on my door, threatening my life. Uh, waking people up till midnight. So there's two weeks of this. I'm trying to hide and yeah. get from my vehicle um, to hide inside. Yeah. And I had a pistol permit, but I I, I didn't want to, you know, even if even if he had a knife, yeah. I didn't want to uh, have have a pistol. And, and plus, I couldn't secure my apartment, so I'd sold all my uh, all my firearms. Yeah. Uh, I had a pepper spray on me. So when because you've been working up in Massachusetts, you never know who you're going to come across up there. <laughs> of course, you didn't think you were going to get it in your own home. Yeah, so on your own property. Um, I came home uh, late on the uh, October 11th. He jumped me. Yeah. And I pepper sprayed him. Police were right there to uh, Amaral and Langlace were right there to arrest me. Right. Um, they refused to take my statement. Yeah. Uh, at the trial they committed perjury saying that I had never asked to make a complaint and I you know you know me I can't shut up to save my life no you don't shut up for nothing and, <laughs> and there was another seven times that Caldwell tried to uh, come and attack me um, a, at least one of the times I ran to uh, uh, in to your apartment came in and locked the door and he was banging on the door threatening me right. um, calling the police they uh, would come sometimes after three hours or not at all. Yeah, by the time he was gone already. Yeah, um, he attacked me in a, in a restaurant of crowded people, the Arizona. Yeah. Uh, punched me. Um, he was drunk in there, called the police, and they don't show up uh, for two and a half, three hours. So all the patrons that w witnessed and had their suppers interrupted by, the, my, by my being attacked, this is after the, the um, initial incident. Yeah. So the trial, um, I'd had to, I tried to have Judge Jonathan Kaplan removed for bias in uh, civil trials. I'm a, I'm a, a landlord, contractor, etc. So the, so the uh, I noticed that Judge Kaplan in, in civil trials had bias, and I had written a, a nasty letter uh, to the uh, uh, court clerk with a docket number. Um, disagreeing with uh, Kaplan's decision, uh, Haas versus Erickson, where um, I had alleged that there was insurance fraud, and you know he didn't ask any questions. There's, there's no when you when you try to report a felony to uh, the court, they should take your information or it, you know at least ask. He just ruled again against me because uh, landlord. He, he and I were making faces at each other. We didn't like each other, and he, um, he's known in other cases for, uh, Going you know, being the contractors. Yeah, and being petty and making faces at people. He's just, and he enjoys uh, ruling against people taking away kids. So you know, it's it's not just me. It's Chris Kennedy and other people that he's just a absolutely abused. Yeah. Uh, Seems to be like a one-sided judge. Uh, the prosecutor Keith Courier. Uh, he told me if I evicted Lana Thompson, a prostitute that had just moved in to my uh, properties without my permission, yeah. I couldn't get the police to do anything about it. Uh, I even wrote to the newspaper journal Inquirer, uh, and it was titled, Illegal Tenant Moves In, and they had my initials. That's, uh, I forget his name. He's, he's the like consumer advocate. So the police were really upset about me writing in the, in the newspaper, even though that was just my initials. And so I went to the prosecutor, Keith Courier. I said, can you, uh, you know, prosecute this woman because she basically um, is trespassing Spotting and she's stealing. Yeah, she didn't have to pay for electricity because um, I couldn't turn it off. She just moved in, changed the locks. She had a dog, that, a German Shepherd that bit somebody. Yeah. Um, who's that crackhead that uh, had the German Shepherd? Um, well, anyway... Uh, I don't remember. Well, he had a, um, a German Shepherd also, but her German she Shepherd bit him, and he was too busy um, 
worried about getting his next uh, uh, hit of crack, so he got into a minivan that was basically the crack shuttle to Hartford, so he got his crack, and so I didn't hear anything more about the dog bite, but, you know, I could have been sued for um, an illegal tenant with her dog. So the prosecutor, Keith Courier, told me that if I evicted her, that he'd prosecute me. And, like, for what? I haven't even been arrested for anything. So after I'd been arrested for uh, pepper spraying Brian Caldwell, he'd said, give me your money or I'll kill you after he jumped me on my property. And there was um, a witness to that, Clayton Varno, and he made a statement. He was on probation. Clayton Varno was on probation, and he told me that the police were threatening him um, if he helped me. So basically they're trying to intimidate a witness. And then he basically took off, so there, were, there was an um, eyewitness. Uh, so I, had, um, I couldn't get uh, any kind of deal from the prosecutor. Keith Courier said that um, I could plead guilty and I was going to get a year and a half in jail. And this is, um, you know, I was the victim of a crime, you know, stalking. Two weeks I was being stalked. And then he kept stalking me. He tried to yeah. either attack me. Almost every day he was up on a property looking for you. Yeah, and, and I, I called Tony Guglielmo, who's the state senator of Stafford Springs, Connecticut, and each time that Brian, there was a Brian Caldwell incident, I would call him, you know, in your presence, I would call to, Tony Guglielmo, yeah. and so, and sometimes the incident was going on right when I was calling Tony Guglielmo, where he could hear what was going on, because I was leaving a recording for him, because I called his, uh, um, his recording yeah. number. And Tony Guglielmo is on the Public Safety Committee, which um, basically uh, legislates for laws that have to do with um, police officers in Connecticut. He's also part of the uh, uh, in, 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 Government Administrative Review, some committee like that, that in, in, investigates public corruption and um, things not operating smoothly. So if anybody was to help with... Um, the railroading of me to prison, uh, making me lose five hundred thousand dollars of property. I I had worked three years, uh, real hard, fixing up those properties. So hundreds of thousand dollars obtaining, fixing them up, years of work, and at the time I also um, had a fourteen-year-old daughter, Sarah. Sarah. So the police wanted. They told me I was kicked out of. Stafford Springs. I was kicked out. I still own the uh, the properties. So uh, they allegedly offered Peter Kukos uh, help getting a gun permit. Uh, he did, had been addicted to crack, crack cocaine, and alcohol, uh, smokes marijuana, uses pres prescription drugs. So he was going to Narcotics Anonymous somewhere in the uh, Boston area. And uh, so he, he figured that he couldn't get a gun permit without uh, state police help. So allegedly, uh, Trooper Mulcahy was the resident state trooper in Stafford. And uh, Officer Prochaska was the, uh, uh, was that the constable, it's a you know, state police officer, not, I mean, a town officer. And Kukos told me that um, he was to get me kicked out of town because um, the police wanted him to, and he was allowed to do anything he wanted. He said, "He said I can, I can threaten you. I can, I can, um, I can beat you." So he ended up punching me in the back of the head, telling me he wanted my daughter to give him a blowjob, get on her knees and give him a blowjob. Fourteen-year-old daughter. So I'd already been attacked once um, and then arrested. So I didn't want to spend the rest of my life um, in jail for. Res, you know, resisting getting beaten up again, um, you know, right, right where I live. Same place. <laughs> uh, he left a uh, message on my, on a tape, on my voicemail, saying that he wanted uh, my daughter to call him Mr. Kukos, and if she didn't, she was dead. Yeah. He was threatening my daughter's life. I remember that. And so, who I had to report this to was Trooper uh, Mulcahy, the resident state trooper, and Officer Prochaska. And so I brought the tape down. And they told me that if I pursued charges against Kukos, that they would arrest me 
and I was um, I was kicked out of Connecticut, and if I didn't leave, that I would be arrested again. So I had to I had to leave um, Connecticut before uh, before trial because I was kicked out by these officers. So um, I hired attorney Michael Agronoff to be my lawyer, and he told me I was attacked on my own property, so um, I wasn't going to get any trouble. And since I wasn't able to get AR, which is accelerated real rehabilitation, um, which means basically your charges are erased. You know, I had no record, so. Uh, so he told me there's no problem. So he, he told me that um, I was gonna pay $5,000. So I, um, I gave him uh, $5,000. And uh, so I told him what witnesses I wanted. He interviewed my tenants. All he did was rack up hours. You know, he was supposed to call Senator Google Ammo and- He didn't even come over and check out the view from the apartment. Yeah where the tree was in the way, so there's no way that she could have saw what she said she saw. Okay, the tenant, um, Don Sullivan and his uh, girlfriend, I was evicting the two of them, and yeah. um, they were in the front of Free Church Street. Yeah. So I was attacked on the side of Five Church Street, and uh, Cheryl Gothier said that um, on the stand that uh, she had witnessed from her apartment that uh, that I, I was attacking uh, Brian. Brian Caldwell, um, and from her position, there's a house in her way. So yeah, house in a tree. House in a tree. Yeah. yeah. He never did come and look at that. Yeah. So um, so basically, this woman can see through a, a house. Yeah, a tree. And uh, I wasn't allowed to stand up in front of the court and say. And, and there's a diagram of the properties just to show. That um, it was the only witness against me was obviously lying because you can't see through a house from inside her apartment, yeah. and that's what she said. Well, she wanted to start trouble for you because you were trying to evict her. Yeah, she for told. Not her rent. She, she, yeah, so she told me payback's a bitch. She had Brian Caldwell waiting in her apartment to attack me. Yeah. So uh, the police wouldn't allow me to make a statement complaining about Brian Caldwell. So Brian Caldwell was never arrested for stalking. He also told me, give me your money or I'll kill you. That's that's attempted mugging, that's attempted robbery. Yeah. Um, so all this came out in court, not the you know, not the fact that the tenant was lying, but Judge Kaplan knew that Brian Caldwell had threatened my life while demanding money and had been making threatening phone calls, threatening my life. He also brought up um, in he court. My, my number all the time too, bugging me about it. Yeah, he was calling the tenants. Yeah. He was telling tenants that, oh, you're not going to have a landlord when you right. when um, when he comes home and kill him. Yeah, threatened to do you. I forget what he said. Uh, Kick your ass when you got home. Uh, Melissa, yeah. the bartender down at Larks, a tenant with uh, Don yeah. Labier, uh, uh, she was she was telling me that. He was down bragging at, at the bar that he was gonna he was gonna kick my ass and kill me. Yeah. So he was he was making it well known that he was he planned on attacking me. Because yeah. she talked to me about it. Yeah. That she heard that. So Brian Caldwell was looking for trouble. Yeah. Um, I worked about 12 hours a day. I came home. I was tired. Yeah. So was I looking for trouble when I came home from from work? No, you were just trying to get out of your van and get some sleep. So all right. Get up and do it all over again. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, so, if you give somebody prison, I got a year in prison, three years probation, plus the um, highest fines and strictest conditions, and no record. They wouldn't give me a AR, the, the prosecutor wouldn't, so that's why I had to get a lawyer, Agronoff. So, Don Labier had, uh, he was on probation for something. His wife, Melissa, the one that was the bartender, uh, she was allegedly having an affair with a neighbor somewhere. So, Don Le Labier, uh, came to where she was, uh, kicked the screen door in, uh, punched the guy in the face, breaking his nose. Um, so, so Don Labier was on probation, and he goes and he attacks somebody, you know, in their apartment. And then he, I guess he also attacked his wife. So he wasn't violated on probation for that. And so I wasn't, I didn't have any record at all. So I got prison right out of the box. 
Does that sound strange? Yeah, that's odd. <laughs> and Judge Jonathan if Kaplan. Anything, it should have been probation if there was any question of it. Yeah. So Judge Jonathan Kaplan was aware of what Brian Caldwell did and what he, uh, what he said to Brian Caldwell after he found out that, you know, he was threatening my life, that he attacked me on my property, was making threatening phone calls, and was disturbing uh, all of my tenants, uh, neighbors, you know, banging on my door saying he was going to cut my dick off in the middle of, you know, after midnight. Yeah. So that's okay. And he, and he said to Brian Caldwell, don't do that again. And Kaplan screamed at me for a good half hour at, the, at sentencing before he sent me for, for uh, resisting, be, um, overreacting to being mugged was yeah. uh, a, a, something that came up. And about midway through the trial when I was winning, because I had to, had to go to trial at your taxpayer expense, uh, I, was, I was winning. So uh, then, then was the only time I was offered AR by the judge because they figured that I was going to win. And I had planned on suing the state police for civil rights uh, violations, um, and I proposed laws. So they had wanted me. Uh, they had wanted me to uh, just shut up and, and, and to prison. So I, I figured I was going to win. So I figured I could sue the state police because I'd already sold my properties at a loss, and I'd gone through all this crap. So I wanted, you know, restitution from them. Yeah. So I figured I was going to win. So I said no. And uh, Agronoff was. You want to clear your name? Yeah. So Agronoff was called into um, private chambers, private chambers by Judge Jonathan Kaplan. And when uh, Agronoff came out, he was all red faced, and he says, um, "I was told that I'm not allowed to defend you. I can't. Um, I can't say that the cops committed perjury. I can't question um, anything the cops say. I can't question the witness and her credibility. So basically." he became part of, part of the prosecution. Yeah. So he didn't call any witnesses. He called character witnesses initially saying, oh, you know, you know, I had a nice character and, you know, I was honorable and all this, you know, I, you know, which, which I am yeah. and was. And he didn't want to call any witnesses to me being attacked and threatened, which I find odd. So the only witness that was going to be called that had any knowledge of anything on my side was you. Yeah. And so... Agronoff tried to sneak down and tell you to go home so you wouldn't even be a witness. Yeah, I was already on the elevator to leave. So he came down and got me. Yeah. Because you told him to. Yeah, I said, you said our only witness. I mean, what are you, what are you yeah. doing? Trying to lose us? Yeah. So, so you had to make it look good and come get me. And so um, was he asking you questions in a hostile way or trying to... Did, did he seem like he was trying to defend me as a... Defend me or, or attack you and what you had to say? What do you mean? Agronoff, yeah. Court? Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't. It wouldn't. It didn't seem like a defense attorney, um, like a prosecutor. I recall. Yeah, I recall him yelling at you yeah. and getting you all upset, upset and confused. So um, he couldn't get out what 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 actually happened. That I was being threatened. I was trying to tell them that the cops wouldn't even listen to my answering machine, which had threatening messages for two weeks on it. I'd been saving them on there. It wasn't a tape one, so I couldn't just give you the tape. They had to listen to it physically. And of course, as soon as any kind of surge or something, that's lost, you know. Yeah, so um, Troopers Amaral and Lang Lois, or Lang Lace, um, on the stand said that I had never asked to make a complaint against Caldwell, right. Brian Caldwell. So that's committing perjury. Well, you, have, you, you were telling them you were attacked. I could hear that out my bathroom window. They wouldn't let me go outside. So they didn't, they didn't want it, and they wouldn't interview uh, my tenants. They wouldn't interview. The, I, I, I told them that there was a witness right then and there where he lived. They wouldn't even go find the witness that was right with me. So they wanted to arrest me. Um, and what I what I've since found out is that if you try to propose laws for the state police, yeah. I, I propose laws to Oversight. Tony Guglielmo, yeah, Oversight. Oversight of uh, police. And I wanted them to do something about the uh, uh, heroin and crack cocaine dealing on and near my property. Right, there's a lot of that going on. You're because, trying to clean that up. Yeah, so if you had three arrests on your property, they can take your property. That's right. So they force you to, you know, I wanted to make sure that that was gone and off my off and near my property. Uh, what I found out is they, they hire police informants 
to engage in criminal activity. Uh, state police have relationships with prostitutes, you know, sometimes sex, sometimes sex, and paying them to uh, commit crimes to set other people up. So they collect revenue. They, they, uh, they have property that they seize, they seize cash, and if you don't solve the problem, you can continually collect money like a tax from the problem and property and uh, cash. So they ruin families. They, I haven't had a decent job since I was got out of prison. I had an insurance adjuster job. Um, I was making $2,600 a week for working seven days. That was after taxes. As soon as they found out that, um, that I had a prison record, you know, I, I was honest on my um, on my application. They fired me, and when I got out of prison, I tried to. I went to uh, uh, FedEx. I went to grocery stores. I went to Home Depot. Uh, being on parole, probation, and having a violent record, and having been in prison, um, just about nobody wants to hire me. They can't get an apartment. I was um, absolutely financially can't ruined. Check an account. No. Most checking, I can't, um, some places I guess will, but I apply and I can't, I can't even get a, a checking account because they do a background check. Can't get an apartment because they do a background check. So and that's the first thing that shows up. Yep. Yeah. So too violent to even get a, you know, get a job or most jobs. So what, you know, being poor, um, it ended my relationship with my daughter at 14. So didn't didn't teach her how to how to drive. It wasn't at her high school graduation. Um, I won't be at her. College. Yeah, I, I have. I don't know how she's doing. Um, she'll probably graduate um, college for be a biology teacher. I won't see her. Um, and walking down her down the aisle when she gets married, uh, probably won't be invited. Probably won't know anything about it. And all because um, I was falsely arrested. Two Connecticut State Troopers committed perjury, and. How much have I not paid in taxes? I'm not, I don't own a home. I used to. I don't have health insurance. Um, I was homeless for a while, and I lived outside in the snow, so I could have froze to death. How much? You know, how much? How many millions of dollars, just in my case, um, haven't come in for taxes? I haven't been buying new cars. I haven't been consuming, and also, um, I've told other people about what's happened in Connecticut. So, uh, people have not bought houses, not had businesses and not lived in Connecticut based on um, knowing for a fact what's been done to me. Right. So I got out of Connecticut for that reason too. <laughs> um, speaking of Peter Kukos, or getting back to Peter Kukos, yeah. uh, he, on uh, he, uh, honor about October 4th, uh, 2003, because I was already, uh, I I'd gotten out of, out of jail, uh, said that uh, I had broken into the basement yeah. of uh, 5 Church right. Street and that I had um, left a picture of myself that said, fuck the police. Right. Now, who in the right mind would do something like that? So that's obviously making a false police report. Right. You were nowhere on the property. Right I was now. I was way in another state. I, I had proof. you were in Massachusetts. Yeah, I was in Massachusetts. I have, I have witnesses at the time. Yeah. So he made a false statement to police. Right. And had he got them to take the um, complaint, because um, uh, state police and town police in Connecticut, they'll take false statements and they'll um, coerce witnesses to get give the statements they want. So basically they can just railroad you. So I, I could have spent, uh, I don't know what time for burglary is, I could have spent another five or ten years yeah. in prison because Peter Kukos is, you know, a lying uh, crack cocaine addict bipolar. bipolar he, yeah, yeah. He, he admitted that on a tape. Yeah, he also cool. he also told he also left a message on my voicemail that if I didn't give him a check for thirty thousand dollars, that he was going to make a false statement involving a gun, and that I would go away for the rest of my life. So I better pay him thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, and and threatening my daughter. I mean, how many crimes can somebody? Telling me that he would evict me if I had you come over. Yeah, and he told you that the police had. Uh, yeah, that the police said it was okay to do. That's totally out of hand. Yes, it is. 
So if you wave to me. Oh, I'm just making sure that it um, hadn't, hadn't stopped. It's recording under the computer. All right. Um, anything that you want to add or I'm trying to think of what... Well, my life has been ruined. And, and you know, for no reason. Yeah. And if I go... You were the victim. You were the victim, not the other way around. Yeah, I was the victim, so I end up going to prison. You, you pay, you're paying for this. If I go to court now, if I go to Rockville Court in uh, Connecticut and I try to get my charges undone, I'm worried about getting arrested just for being in Connecticut. If I go to the court, um, I'm worried about spending the rest of my life in jail for just trying to... Uh, Clear your name. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Judge Kaplan, there was a VHS tape on the juries were given an instruction. Um, it, the, the tape told how to find a defendant guilty. Nothing about reasonable doubt for finding the defendant innocent. So later it was in the newspaper, I believe the Hartford Current, that this, um, that this same judge, John, Jonathan Kaplan, felt that the tape was unfair and it was thrown out because yeah. it prejudiced the jury, so that my jury was tampered with. So just that alone should have got you a retrial. Also, there was a worker for the police that ended up being the jury foreman. You're allowed, as a lawyer, or you know, you're know, you allowed to strike. I found out that he was a uh, wanted to be a police officer, work with the police, and my argument was with um, the police lack of service and yeah. violating my civil rights. I wanted to sue the police. So the jury foreman um, that my lawyer wouldn't strike ended up being the jury foreman, tainted the jury, so I was found guilty. And so I was sentenced to a year in jail, three years probation, and I have no history of alcohol or drugs, uh, yet Jonathan Kaplan said I had to take those for classes. Yeah. Um, said I had to take anger management. And but you're the least angriest person I know. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm angry now, but I'm not. Well, I'm you're never, angry now, yeah, because yeah, you got reason to be. But you uh, weren't before that. And then it was a, a 2,500 or so uh, fine, or I don't, I don't know what it was that I had no way to pay because they'd bankrupted me with the, um, me selling my properties at a, at a loss. Yeah. Uh, and I, anger management, uh, drug and alcohol counseling. And then I had to go get mental health counseling uh, twice a week, which was a huge expense after I got out of, out of jail. Um, why would you need um, uh, a psychiatrist or psychologist um, two times a week after for, the fact. for yeah after the fact for pepper spraying somebody that attacked you during a, a, a robbery attempt right. um, use, use pepper spray on people all the time. I, I, um, I'd be crazy not to do something right if I didn't fight back I, he told me he was gonna cut my you know my off. my mail off yeah, yeah. so to, to have at least pepper spray I mean that was better than a gun like what you had a permit for but you didn't use that did you well with, that's a whole different story Jimmy Hogenkamp um, and others kept breaking in my apartment, so I couldn't secure. Um, if I wanted to have a six-pack of beer in my refrigerator, um, it was stolen. Um, I couldn't have toilet paper; it was stolen. Razors were stolen. Soap was stolen. Your laundry. My laundry. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I'd, I'd go in for a clean towel. My laundry was stolen. Yeah. This is my own, in my own property, yeah. and I couldn't call the police about breaking and entering because they they don't do investigations, and the people that they are friends with that are the police informants and the prostitutes and the drug dealers are their friends and people that aren't organized crime or connected are their enemy like um, property investors that don't have a grandfather buried in a local cemetery that aren't one of the you know main families of Four Stafford fathers. yep other towns are like that Enfield's like that there's all over Connecticut um, if you don't know somebody that's been in government for whatever amount of time one of their families um, or the Irish, Jewish, and Italian mafia. They, they, don't, they all kind of... like that in Bristol when I lived in Bristol. So, if, you, if you're not part of their crew... Um, My brother-in-law couldn't get on the police force, which he tried for, because it was all Italian families. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, whoever's running it, and and basically, um, you know, before I started to uh, fix up the properties, uh, Selectman John Julian told me I was not allowed to uh, rent any Blacks, he used the uh, N-word. Um, he also said that he didn't want any any um, Spanish. He used the derogatory term for Spanish people. In fact, the Stafford Market there, he wanted the Spanish food taken off the shelves in that market. 
and I think it was a reduced because he didn't want um, the uh, the S word for Spanish people. That's uh, derogatory. Um, having their food in you know the local market. Okay. So. Oh yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, he also prejudice. he also told me that one of his more important friends wanted my properties, and he asked me how much I paid for them, and I'd spent already a hundred thousand dollars fixing them up, besides what I paid for them. Yeah. So he wanted. He said, well. You should have come to me before you started working on them because somebody more important wants them. And he says, you'll eventually come to me anyway. So somebody more important is, I guess, one of his mafia buddies. He's uh, French and Italian, John Julian, so I don't think he's, you know, full mafia, but, um, you know. He's also dead now. Yeah, he's dead. <laughs> so. Can't get him to retract nothing. Nope. Well, I'd like to question him about the... You know, the drug deal that was right outside his uh, law office when he was selectman for, what, 5, 10, 15 years? David Hayes? Yeah. Well, actually uh, did go to prison when they got done using him. Yeah, well, allegedly David Hayes was supplying uh, John Julian uh, with crack cocaine so he could smoke it, and he could smoke it with his girlfriend. So, you know, he'd have uh, various, uh, I don't know if they were prostitutes or what, but um, he paid him for sex with... Uh, uh, crack cocaine, allegedly. allegedly. Yeah. I wonder if you got um, brain cancer from uh, smoking that uh, crack cocaine. I wonder. I don't know. I'm not sure what the effects will do. <laughs> I'm sure it's not good. <laughs> um, that's the culture of Stafford. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hope I help you.